Hi, I'm uh, Mr. Soboleski. I'm going to be running through some capped crash course material. Uh, now, capped is a test that all 10th graders across the state take, and by this point, most high schools have some sort of physical science type class, and there's a lot of tasks and subjects that they cover in there that you may not have seen before. So, um, dividing this up into like three class periods. So, part one, we're going to cover uh, experimental design, including variables, solar cookers, polymers, acid bases. Uh, plate tectonics in the rock cycle, uh, and then there's more coming up. So the idea is, after these three lessons, you should have a basic understanding of some of the things that you may not have seen before that a lot of other students in the state have seen. Uh, keep in mind, the CAP test is definitely a science reasoning test. It's very little pure fact. It's about figuring out problems. But, you know, if they ask you a question about, like, a solar cooker or ask you a question about a polymer, we want you to just have some basic... Uh, background knowledge about what that is. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the first idea here is about experimental design or your variables. Uh, so the most important thing you have to understand are how to identify what your variables are. So there's independent, dependent, and controlled variables. Okay. Now these all kind of have different names too that you just should be aware of in case you see them on the capped. Independent is sometimes called manipulated. Dependent is sometimes called responding. And controlled variables, sometimes these are called constants. You should also understand a concept called the control. So we sort of rarely use these terms in chemistry because most of the labs we do aren't really inquiry or investigation type labs. It's more about uh, kind of seeing something and experiencing something that we learn about, um, you know, from reading or, or from a lecture. Um, but most of the experiments you'll see on CAP will follow this really nice sort of cookie cutter process. Now the independent variable, independent, yeah, can't even spell. I'm trying to write and talk at the same time. Independent variable. Uh, that's going to be the variable that you kind of choose to change. It's the one that you're investigating. So, you know, if I want to see um, what color car uh, gets the hottest in the summer, well, what color car is going to be my independent variable? And we call that manipulated because you are manipulating it. It's, it's like, I'm going to choose to change this one thing, and I'm going to see how something responds to that. Leads us into dependent is the responding variable. The dependent variable is the thing that you're it's like the data that you're going to collect to prove what you want to prove about the independent variable. I like to think uh, dependent is like your data. And it's called responding because it, it will respond to the manipulated variable. Your controlled variables, also known as your constants, those are the variables that have to remain exactly the same from trial to trial to trial. So really, you're going to be, you're choosing to change one thing, and that's this. Your dependent variable is going to change as a result of that, and that's just like the data you collect. And everything else in a good experiment has to be controlled. And finally, the control, or sometimes it's called a control group, that's like a separate trial that you run where you don't really apply the independent variable. You kind of leave it natural because um, that will give you a good way to see if your investigation is actually, um, or if your hypothesis is based on the independent bar variable. So this is much easier with examples, so let me just run through a couple of these. All right, so you perform a test to see how the brightness of light affects how a plant grows. So let's say you want to grow some plants, you want to see how bright you want to make it. Uh, so your independent or manipulated variable, in this case, is going to be the brightness of the light. That's the thing that you're looking to investigate, and you're going to manipulate that by probably setting up like three different light bulbs, you know, maybe a bright uh, uh, average light and a very dim light. Your dependent variable, that's like your data. Now in this case, the best data you want to probably collect is something to do with the plants. Whether you want to count the number of plants, whether you want to um, see how long they take to reach a certain height, that'd be like time. You could wait for them all to grow and then cut them and find the mass. Either way, you just want to find some kind of data and that's going to be your dependent or responding variable. Your controlled variables need to be everything else, and everything else should be held constant. Things like the temperature of the room, the room itself. You don't want to do trial one in your kitchen and trial two in the bathroom and trial three outside. 
Um, things like the same type of seed. Obviously, you're not going to do sunflowers here and corn here. Uh, just all those sorts of factors. You should be able to come up with several controlled variables or constants. Uh, time is certainly something you want to control. Uh, type of fertilizer, type of uh, uh, volume of water that you give to them. And finally, a control. In this case, there's not the best way to think of it, but I guess I would say um, a trial with, with no light or maybe even a trial with outdoor light. Just something to kind of compare this to. Uh, so let's, let's talk through another one here. Uh, all right, so your performance has to see how soil moisture affects the population growth of worms. Uh, so again, you need to, to this is what you find out what you're investigating and work out your variables here. So for our independent or manipulated variable, it's kind of the thing that you're trying to investigate. In this case, it's soil moisture. So that's your independent variable. You're probably going to run some kind of test where you, uh, you know, soak this soil to basically turn it into mud. This one you give like an average amount of uh, water to, and this one you sort of leave pretty, pretty dry, uh, and that's going to be your independent variable, so the moisture level of the uh, soil. Your dependent variable, that's your data. So in this case, how it affects the growth of worms, population growth, probably the best thing there is to count the number of worms at either points along the way or just at the very end. Um, controlled variables, these are everything that else has to be controlled. So the one thing you're changing is the amount of water. Uh, so things like the type of soil, the amount of soil, the amount of time, the amount of sunlight, the amount of food, everything else that has to be held constant. And finally, a control, I guess in this case, a reasonable control could be uh, no moisture or maybe if you have it outside, natural rain, something like that. Uh, some of these fit better with the control than others, uh, but when it's appropriate for a control, you definitely want to include a control. Uh, for a couple more examples, I pulled up some uh, capped labs. Now, there, there are about 10 different, uh, they call them state embedded tasks. It's, it's things that all 9th and 10th graders do across the state, and these are definitely fair game to be asked about on the cap test. So this one I pulled up is called the Yeast Population Dynamics Lab, commonly called the uh, Yeast Lab. Basically what you do is, you hopefully did this last year, <clears throat> you took uh, yeast, which is a living organism, and you introduced it to uh, different environments based on the amount of molasses in them. Since the, the yeast is going to eat the molasses, you're trying to see um, how the concentration of molasses will affect the population growth of the uh, yeast. And the way you uh, measure that is by measuring the amount of carbon dioxide produced from the yeast, uh, you know, as it metabolizes the molasses. Now, you may have done something slightly different than this. I just pulled this up online. Uh, but in this case, you, you and your lab partner are going to grow the molasses solution uh, with 50% molasses, 25%, 12 6 and 3% molasses. So in this case, your independent variable, that's the thing that you're choosing to manipulate, is going to be the concentration of molasses. That's the one thing that you're changing. Your dependent variable is your data. And in this case, it says as measured by the amount of CO2 produced. So it's going to be your volume of CO2 uh, produced. That's your data, your dependent variable. Uh, controlled variables is everything else. So probably the initial uh, population of the yeast probably something like the volume or the mass of the yeast initially, the number of days per trial, the amount of sunlight, the amount of, uh, I was going to say water, but I guess the water mixes in with this. Um, it's just, you know, the size of the container, everything like that. Um, everything else that has to be held constant. Now, in this case, there probably is a good idea of a control group. Uh, since you're measuring all these different concentrations, a good control group is probably going to be one more trial with no uh, no molasses at all. So like a 0% molasses, in other words, distilled water trial. And that would show you that, you know, maybe it's, it's not the molasses at all that affects it. Let's look at another lab that you guys should have done. This is the enzymes lab, and uh, I believe this is commonly called the applesauce lab. So what happens in this lab is you're going to determine which enzyme, pectinase or cellulase, or combination of the two enzymes, maximizes juice production. 
So the idea here is that you have applesauce, which I guess has some rigidity to it, um, you know, tough kind of cell walls, and these enzymes are going to kind of eat through and, and break down those cell walls and turn it into basically apple juice. So the task is to see which of these enzymes or a combination of them is going to produce the most apple juice. So in this case, your independent variable is going to be your uh, type of enzyme, whether it's pectinase or cellulase or a combination. Uh, your dependent variable, remember dependent is like your data, also known as your uh, responding variable. In this case, it's going to be the volume of apple juice that you recover. And you always want it to be specific like to the data. You don't want to, your dependent variable shouldn't be something like um, which one's the best enzyme or something very broad like that because how do you really measure that? Your dependent variables be, should be measurable. Uh, your controlled variables or your constants everything from the initial volume uh, of applesauce, the, probably the quantities or the volumes of these enzymes. You don't want to do, you know, trial one, 10 milliliters of this, trial two, 20 milliliters of that. You know, keep everything else constant, the amount of time, the amount of light, the temperature, everything else that's held constant. Um, control group, probably something like uh, one more trial with no enzymes, so you don't put anything on it, and you see how much it just naturally forms into apple juice on its own. So these are all examples of uh, labs, and you know, working out independent dependent variables is important. Uh, makes you understand hypotheses. Uh, Cap loves to stress that if-then uh, hypothesis, and I think they even have some examples here. Let's see. Yeah, right here. So if pectinase cellulase and pectinase slash cellulase mixture are added to applesauce, then pectinase will produce the greatest amount of apple juice because it breaks down the most juice related to cellular components. So keep in mind your hypothesis uh, should include both your variables and uh, it definitely explain a, a quick because statement at the end. All right, so from there, let's move on to what another state embedded task is, and that's solar cookers. And what we do in physical science is we use solar cookers to not only explain uh, sort of lab design and variables, but also the basics of heat transfer. So what a solar cooker is, is something like this. It's basically a, a, like a box or an oven that you make out of basic materials. And the idea is you try to capture heat to do something like boil water or uh, cook cookies, bake cookies, or uh, like melt M&Ms or something like that using just the power of the sun. So the idea is you want to kind of reflect the sun, trap the heat in there. So let me just scroll through some pictures. This looks like a pretty uh, advanced one there. You can see real nice uh, mirrors on the side. Um, that looks pretty advanced too. Nice uh, sort of parabolic mirror under there. You can see they got water boiling in the pot. Ooh, that looks advanced too. So the idea here is um, what you want to do with it with a solar cooker is first of all you need to bounce light into whatever you're you're looking at. The basic ones, uh, you know, something like something like that. Even uh, you always want to bounce the light in. And the, the type of heat transfer we're talking about with that is going to be your radiation from the sun. Remember, the three types of heat transfer are conduction, which is direct contact between surfaces, con, uh, convection, which is the movement of heat sort of upwards through liquids and gases, and radiation, which is heat that travels uh, in waves sort of through space. So the purpose of the, the mirrors is uh, to take advantage of that radiation from the sun. You want it to bounce right into the cup or whatever you're trying to do. Um, most of these, you'll see a lot of them have kind of plastic wrap. In fact, I can see plastic wrap there. Let me see if I can see some more. Here's a good example. There's a, like, it looks like glass covering the top. And the idea there is you want to take advantage of convection. So as the sun hits this, uh, the heat is going to kind of start at the bottom where the sun hits it. And it's going to sort of convect up because, uh, you know, when you have it, air in this case or water, um, as it warms up it sort of expands and that causes it to be less dense and, and rise up. And if you don't have a lid there it's just going to float up into space and be lost. So with the lid there you're kind of creating a little convection cell. 
And finally, the last type of heat transfer is uh, conduction. A uh, good way to utilize conduction is to have some sort of black material near the bottom, since color black absorbs heat the best. Uh, if the pot of water is directly touching a black surface, it's going to get the most conduction from that. So again, solar cooker, you'll, you'll probably see something like that in the context of what's the independent variable, dependent variable. So something like um, a student builds a solar cooker uh, to see how the color of the cup affects the temperature inside. So your independent variable is going to be your color of the cup. Your dependent variable would be the temperature of the water or the temperature of the air. And your controlled variables would be the length of time it took to, uh, to heat up, the volume of water, the uh, outside air temperature, time of day, all those types of, uh, types of things. And then a good control for that would be to have a separate cup that's just sitting outside on the ground. So now you're testing, you know, is your solar cooker actually effective or is the sun itself going to do a better job? Okay, from there... I'm going to talk about polymers. Polymers is another uh, concept that all 9th and 10th graders at some point need to learn about. So, polymers. Polymers, I'll write this one out, it is important. These are long chains uh, of repeating molecules. called monomers. So poly means many, mono means one. So a monomer is a, a little molecule that uh, forms long chains to form a polymer. Now, not everything is a monomer. You can't just string a whole bunch of things together, anything together, and call it a polymer. Um, a good monomer is something with, um, with sort of that's able to form long chains. So in other words, it has an opening on one side, opening on the other. And again, I'm talking about molecules here. So when I say an opening, I really mean uh, like a lone electron that another sort of uh, molecule can, can ionically or actually more likely covalently bond to. Um, and a great example of kind of your classic monomer is just the carbon atom. Because we know carbon has four valence electrons. And you can see here that another carbon can go right here another carbon can go right here and really you can even have carbons coming off the top and bottom or you can have other atoms coming off the top and bottom now it doesn't have to just be one element that's repeating a lot of times it's some kind of uh, molecule that itself forms the monomer and it repeats over and over again so there's a couple different ways we categorize polymers um, one category is synthetic versus organic uh, or natural uh, synthetic means man-made, and that's basically, um, that's, that's a good uh, one category of polymers. So, you know, humans have made a, a lot of different polymers. Uh, most types of plastics, pretty much all types of plastics are man-made polymers. Um, Teflon is a man-made polymer, Kevlar, uh, PVC, styrofoam, um, uh, polyethylene, uh, Po uh, polyester, these are, all, these are all types of polymers that are synthetic, created by humans in labs. Um, then there's natural or, or uh, organic polymers. Organic generally means anything carbon-based, um, but usually it means um, you know, natural as well. So your, uh, your natural polymers are sort of most parts of the human body, our, our muscles, our, our skin, uh, it's just long sort of repeating chains of carbon-based monomers called polymers. Your DNA is a polymer. Uh, RNA is a polymer. Uh, most of what makes you up is a polymer. Uh, another way we categorize polymers is by their structure, and there's three main categories for that. The first is linear. Uh, a linear polymer, we kind of represent that, represent it sort of like this where it just forms in one long line. The next type is branched. Which, as you can guess, it starts as linear, but then it has branches going off the side. So something like this, or something like that. And the third kind is called cross-linked. In 
the idea behind cross-linked is that you have linear polymers that branch and connect to one another. So something like this. And it's important to, uh, to note the differences in, in structures and how they relate to sort of the toughness of these polymers. Uh, in terms of the weakest one, a lot of people think linear because it's the most basic one. But what you have to realize is that a linear polymer, you can stack it and, and sort of compile them and compress them together. Like lots of these can be very densely packed. So therefore, linear is actually a pretty strong polymer. The weakest polymer is going to be branched because these branches, if they're not really attached to anything else, they don't add anything to the structure of it. Uh, they just take up space. It's almost like if you're, like let's say a tree falls during a storm. You're going to cut the tree up and cut all the branches off. And then if you have to bag those branches up, uh, it's a lot, you, you can get a lot more densely packed if you cut all the little branches off and then just get the, the straight sort of uh, sticks to all go at the same direction. That would be like if you stacked a bunch of linear polymers together. If you just left all the branches with all the twigs coming off them and tried to put them in a bag, you wouldn't really be able to get them close together. You just take up space. So branched polymers are going to make up your kind of low density and very weak polymers. Cross-linked is going to be your strongest. These kind of cross-links here obviously reinforce it. It's almost like a rebar, a construction material, where you have an interlocked series of... Um, of steel rods that then get mixed in with concrete. It's, it's sort of very self-reinforcing. It's very tough. And just some examples of some of these. Um, again, branched, that's your weakest one because these don't add anything and they just take up space. So most, most very cheap plastic is going to just be branched polymers, whether it's this little cup, uh, whether it's plastic wrap. It, it's usually pretty inexpensive to produce doesn't have a lot of structure to it. Your linear polymers, these are going to be a lot stronger. Um, things like uh, some PVC pipe here. You know, it's got clay on it, but you can feel that's nice and strong. Uh, PVC is polyvinyl chloride, so anytime you see poly in the name of it, it's a good chance that it's going to be a polymer. Uh, Cross-linked polymers, uh, examples of that are like bowling balls. Um, another example is, uh, I mentioned before, um, Kevlar, which makes a bulletproof vest, that's a cross-linked polymer. So the strongest polymers, you're cross-linked. Your next strongest is linear because you can jam them all together. And the weakest ones are going to be branched polymers. Okay. Um, one last thing to comment on. A lot of times you see the letters HDPE and LDPE on the bottom of bottles. In fact, if you have a bottle right now, take a look at the bottom. It's possible that you have those two letters. You just write them out four letters. This stands for high density polyethylene. So here's poly, that indicates it's a polymer. Polyethylene is just kind of the most common type of plastic we produce. So high density, if you want to think of what type of polymer that's going to be, it's going to be your linear polymer, all kind of jammed together, densely packed. So high-density polyethylene is generally going to be a lot stronger. LDPE, well, that just stands for low-density polyethylene. So these are going to be generally your weaker types of plastics. Okay, now, you know, the, the, the way they form also has a lot to do with their structure, the temperature at which they form, and things like that. So it's tough to just look at something and say, well, that's weak, so it's probably br uh, branched. But uh, these are just kind of in general terms. Um, another common example before I move on, for um, cross-linked polymers are tires. Uh, generally, tires are long strands of rubber, uh, which is a natural polymer, rubber from a rubber tree, and rubber is generally branched or linear, and what happens is to make car tires, they take sulfur and they cross-link it with sulfur. So you end up, like, here's your basic sulfur, 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 and these are all your carbons, and this process is actually called vulcanization, and what it does is it uh, strengthens the rubber, it, uh, I, I believe it, it kind of makes it a little more solid in the summer and in the winter. It kind of keeps its form and it makes it tougher. Okay, so that's a lot of good information on polymers. 
Uh, I need to talk about the Polymer Lab, which is another one of those state embedded tasks. It's something that every ninth and 10th grader is expected to have some familiarity with. So in the Polymer Lab, the purpose of the lab is to obtain a bunch of samples of polymers. Basically, it means get a bunch of different types of plastic bags. So whether it's a uh, you know, classic shopping bag, a uh, trash bag, uh, like a leaf bag, dry cleaning bag, plastic wrap, you just want a whole bunch of samples of uh, plastic. And the idea is you're supposed to test for one or three different variables, um, and those being, um, I guess, uh, abrasion resistance, Um, puncture resistance and resistance to stretching. I believe this last one they call it tensile strength. Um, so the idea is you, you choose one of these or multiple and you perform an experiment. Now for abrasion resistance, what we generally do in physical science is you take like a piece of wood and you move it back and forth across the uh, plastic and see how long it takes to, to rip it. Puncture resistance uh, will take like a, a PVC pipe like this and like wrap the, the polymer plastic on top and then we'll like drop pencils through it and see if they stab through. And your resistance to stretching, this is kind of the classic one. You take a little strip and you like tie it to a table and then you, you attach it to a cup and you just keep adding weights to the cup until it breaks. Um, so I'm just going to talk through a little bit more of this and let's apply our, our knowledge of variables to this. Um, so imagine you were doing the lab I just performed. Uh, your task was to um, see how the t different types of polymers um, are resistant to stretching. So your independent variable or your manipulated variable is going to be the type of polymer that you choose. So you're going to do different trials with different types of bags. You might do one trial with a dry cleaning bag, one trial with a black uh, leaf bag, shopping bag. So your, your type of polymer or plastic is going to be your independent or manipulated variable. Your dependent variable, remember dependent is like your data. That's what you're going to, that, that's what responds to the manipulator, which is why they call it responding variable. Uh, in that case, the way I described it, you attach a cup to it and you add weights. So your dependent variable there is the mass that it held before breaking, or you could make it the mass that actually broke it, uh, but it's some something sort of like that. You could also actually measure the distance it stretched to before it broke, but either way, uh, your dependent variable is going to be the data you collect. Your controlled variables are everything that you kept constant in all your trials. Uh, so things like the length and width of the strip, um, the cup used to hold them, uh, the tape used to hold it to the table, basically everything else. Uh, in this case, can't really think of a good control for this. Again, not every lab uh, fits the model for having a control group, uh, but maybe something along the lines of uh, something besides a polymer or, or uh, I guess no way it wouldn't work. So again, some of these have a clear cut control, some of them don't. Okay. I'm going to now talk about acids and bases very quickly. Now, this is something that we cover in a lot of depth in chemistry, but not until May. So we're going to cover a crash course. I'll give you like five to ten minutes on uh, acids and bases. So acids are chemicals that produce H plus ions when dissolved in water. So basically, it's usually some kind of anion with the appropriate number of hydrogens attached to the front. So a very common acid we use in um, chemistry is hydrochloric acid. So you just take a chlorine anion, and you're going to balance it with hydrogen. So chlorine is a 1 minus charge. Hydrogen is a 1 plus charge. So we need one of these. Now HCl by itself is just hydrogen chloride. But to make it an acid, we dissolve it in water. So therefore... HCl aqueous, hydrochloric acid. Um, 
We could do hydrosulfuric acid, which is H2S aqueous. Uh, we can do uh, polyatomic ions as well. They form a lot of ion uh, acids. So nitric acid, you take nitrate, you balance it with hydrogens. So since nitrate is NO3 with a 1 minus, nitric acid is going to be HNO3. Now you certainly don't need to memorize these for the cap test. They're not going to quiz you on naming acids. But uh, it's good to understand that acids will produce H plus ions when dissolved. Because keep in mind, when this dissolves, the H plus is going to go one way, the NO3 minus is going to go the other way. Um, so there's more acids. There's uh, sulfuric acid is sulfate plus two hydrogens. There's phosphoric acid is phosphate plus three hydrogens. Uh, remember, the hydrogens come first because they're the cations. Uh, let's talk about bases. Bases produce hydroxide or OH minus ions when dissolved in water. Now you'll learn later that there are there are actually multiple definitions of acids. I'm kind of giving you the uh, the basic. Uh, Lewis acid definition, but this is kind of the most common one, the most simple one. So anything that produces hydroxide ions when dissolved in water, it's basically anything with hydroxide attached to it. Uh, so, you know, barium hydroxide, BaOH2, sodium hydroxide, NaOH, lithium hydroxide, pretty much all of these are going to produce, and again, sorry, I should be adding my aqueous to this, when you dissolve these in water, they form bases. Okay? Now, the fact that they form these H plus and OH minuses when dissolved, um, it, it's very important because of how these are going to interact with water. Because you, know, you might say, oh, so what? Like, who cares that they produce H and OH in water? Well, it has to do with the fact that this OH is going to uh, react with, with the water, this H is going to re react with the water, and it forms a lot of very important properties. So let's talk about some of the main features of acids and bases. Um, acids, they're generally going to have a sour taste. Not that you would ever taste anything in lab. Um, so a lot of natural foods are acidic. Your, all your citrus uh, fruits, lemons, limes, that's uh, citric acid. Uh, bases generally have a bitter taste. Most soaps are bases, so if you ever had soap in your mouth, it's that very ugh, bitter taste. Uh, that is how a base would taste. Um, acids and bases are both very corrosive to organic tissue. You don't want to get an acid on your hand. You don't want to get a base on your hand. Um, you know, very strong ones, that is. Obviously, we like having soap on our hands uh, as long as it's not too basic. Um, something you should note is... Uh, that when you take an acid and a base, well, I guess I should say a strong acid, like a Lewis acid, um, with H on the front and OH on the back of the other, when you mix them together, it's called a neutralization reaction. Uh, this is sort of, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this more in May. Uh, but imagine I have hydrochloric acid plus sodium hydroxide. Well, this is basically a double replacement reaction. Aqueous, aqueous, so the H in the front is going to bond with the OH in the back, get HOH, which is just water, and that's liquid, and then NaCl are going to bond together, and that's going to form aqueous table salt. So what we have here is you can have these incredibly strong concentrations. You could have hydrochloric acid so strong it could burn your hand, sodium hydroxide so strong it could burn your hand. You mix them together, if you do your stoichiometry correctly, you just get salt dissolved in water. So this is actually called a neutralization reaction because you're neutralizing the acid and you're neutralizing the base all in one step. Uh, last thing to talk about with acids and bases is the pH scale. pH, uh, the H in pH refers to the uh, H plus that acids form. Um, and we'll learn all about the formulas for this. P generally refers to negative log of. Um, but uh, the main thing you have to know is that it's a scale that ranges between 1 and 14. 
although there are some acids strong enough to go beyond one or even to go negative, and there are, I believe, also some bases that are so strong bases they can go beyond 14. The middle of the pH scale is 7. Something with a pH of 7 is uh, completely neutral, neither acidic nor basic. And as we work down like this and up like this, we are approaching more acidity this way and basic this way. And this actually throws people off a lot because they think of pH as how acidic something is. So they think the higher pH, the more acidic. But it's really the opposite. So a good way to think of it is the pH scale is really a measure of uh, basicity or really alkalinity is the word for that. Or it's a measure of how basic something is. And something else you should know is that this is a logarithmic scale, meaning every time we go from number to number, it's 10 times. So 10 times this way, 10 times that way, and so on. So something with a pH of 7 uh, is neutral. Something with a pH of 6 is 10 times more acidic than that. Something with a pH of 5 is 100 times more acidic. And it goes the same way with basic. Now, uh, the types of questions you might see on the CAPT about this are something like acid rain has been reported in the forest. You go take a sample of water. Um, what would you expect the pH to be? And they might say like 5, 7, or 9. Well, obviously, the more acidic is going to be 5. Okay. Uh, I just have a few minutes left to talk about plate tectonics and the rock cycle. Uh, this is something that a lot of times have a whole year-long course devoted to them. So I'll try my best to uh, get it in quickly. Um, so plate tectonics. Let's see. I can kind of pick any place to start. But I guess what I'm going to choose is to start at something that's called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. Now, what I'm trying to artfully draw here is uh, the Earth, where I have my ocean here. Oh, actually, that went the opposite way it's supposed to. my ocean here, and my land here. This could be the worst art I've ever done, but you'll see what we need to know. Now, land forms at mid-oceanic ridges, among other places, but this is one of the major places land forms, and it's because the magma from inside the earth, from the mantle, sort of erupts out of the bottom of the ocean and it sinks down and it sort of lands here and it accumulates. Now, magma is the, the sort of liquidy, solidy mixture of rock uh, within kind of one layer of the earth. Basically, the earth's layer go, go like this. We have the crust, which is very thin. They say if earth were an apple, the crust would just be the skin. Then there's the mantle in here. And then we have two cores. There's the outer core and the inner core. And what's interesting about these is they're generally made of the same type of material, but it's just that the pressure is so much higher in here, and that pressure comes from the weight of the entire Earth crushing down on it, that this inner core is solid. This outer core is liquid. They're both very, very hot, but the pressure is so high here that it compresses that liquid actually down into a solid. Um, so anyway, the mantle is going to erupt from the mid-oceanic ridge, and it forms these two sort of mountain ranges on the side. In fact, if you Google Earth um, and just look at the like Atlantic Ocean, it's probably the most clear mid-oceanic ridge we have, you'll see that real clear mountain range that runs right down the middle of the planet. And that's sort of the birth of most of the, of the planet. It, it forms here, and then what happens is these these plates, which the crust is broken up into plates like this, these plates generally move away from that mid-oceanic ridge. Now, what's going to happen is, let me do this one on a separate slide. Let's say this is your mid-oceanic ridge, and here's the plate. As it approaches land, let's see how I can draw this one. I should just pull up pictures from Google. Let me just try to explain this real quick. Um, as the magma sort of erupts out of here and lands on here, this entire plate 
is moving towards this plate, okay? Now, when two continental plates, when two continents meet one another, and I don't just mean like Africa meets uh, Europe, I mean the, the, the crust is broken up into plates, and when one meets another, something basically has to give. Now, continental plates uh, are, are too thick uh, to, to dunk down beneath, but this one here is oceanic plate, and it's very thin. This one here is our continental plate, and it's a lot thicker. So the thin one is actually going to get pushed underneath. So this oceanic plate ends up sinking down back into the mantle here. Now, as it sinks down into, into the mantle, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, and there's a lot of pressure. And what actually happens is this plate starts to melt on its way down. Because again, the plate is just made of rock, mostly silicon dioxide. Now, as this melts, lava forms here, and it kind of rises up, and that's why it's going to erupt from volcanoes uh, out on the side there. Okay? Uh, now, the stuff that doesn't melt, it's going to continue down, and eventually it kind of forms its way back as magma here, and give it enough time, it's going to rise back up. Now, this is a basic cycle here. This is sort of called, well, this is not exactly the rock cycle, but it's a cycle that shows how rocks and much of the earth is, cre is uh, created and, and sustained. Uh, real quick, I've got like one minute. I'm just going to talk about the three rock types. This is another thing that might be on capped. Um, the first type of rock is called sedimentary. Hopefully you maybe had a little of this before. Sedimentary is basically when, when other rocks erode. They break down into little tiny pieces. And those pieces eventually settle. And over thousands of years, they kind of build up and up and up. And when I say settle, I mean they generally travel down rivers and streams and land in lakes or the ocean. And as they pile up, eventually the weight and pressure gets so high that they kind of cement together. So this is an example of sandstone. This is basically sand particles that has built up so high that it uh, compressed together. Uh, this is shale. This is generally pieces of clay that get piled so high they cement together. And this one uh, has little chunks in it. That's called um, conglomerate. You, this actually has like so bigger pieces of rock that kind of cement it together. Next type of rock is igneous. Igneous rock is basically uh, uh, cooled off lava, lava or magma. And there's several different types, so the conditions, or the type of igneous you get depends on the conditions that it was formed in. This is uh, igneous, uh, uh, obsidian, this forms when lava cools very quickly. Um, this is granite, it forms when lava cools very slowly. And this is basalt, this is kind of your classic uh, melted volcano rock. And the last type of rock is called metamorphic. Um, this, the idea behind metamorphic is the plate that makes it very, very, very deep into the earth where there's incredible pressure and temperature, it, it metamorph metamorphoses or undergoes metamorphosis and it changes into a, uh, a much different rock. Now the idea here, it's so hot and such high pressure that all the little rock crystals basically flatten into pancakes. So when it reemerges, because the convection cycles bring it back up eventually, you get rocks with these very long and flat kind of crystals. Like here's a good example here. We see really flat crystals. So those are the three rocks types. I know I just rushed through that, but uh, that sort of ends our first capped video.